lovingly that is. And there was one little voice that told me I should not use overhead today. I always use overhead. And so I just listened to that voice. So good morning, Vision. Change your thinking, change your life. Now, we've heard that many times, over and over. And I remember the very first time I heard that phrase. It was actually a cassette tape. Anybody remember cassette tapes? It was a cassette tape by Louise Hay. And she talked about that you can change your life if you start change to change your thinking. And I thought, wow, that is a great concept. And I'm going to start just to do that and try that. And then I thought, well, hold on a second. I know I can change the thoughts that come up, but why not change in a way so the thoughts don't even come up anymore? Because we don't consciously think to have less than positive thoughts, do we? Those thoughts, they just pop up somehow. So we know that our thoughts crea create our reality. And we also ask ourselves the question, well, how do those thoughts get there in first place? So if our reality is an outpicturing of our thoughts, what are our thoughts an outpicturing of? What are they a result of? Our thoughts are a result of our behaviors, of our beliefs, of our values, and of all the meaning that we have given to our past experiences. So if we want to change our life, changing our thinking is a fantastic step, and we already do that. But if we want to change our lives, ultimately, we also must change our values, our beliefs, and the meaning that we have given to all of the experiences of our past. Because that is part of what creates our reality. Does that make sense? I was drawn to a book yesterday. And for some reason, I just thought, I need to pick this book up. There's something in there that I need to know for tomorrow. And it's a book that I haven't read uh, in eight years or so. And I opened it up, and I, I thought, oh, I have highlighted stuff in there. So the very first page that I opened up, I looked at the very first sentence that I highlighted, and it said, it's not what you want that you attract. You attract what you believe to be true. That's a very powerful thought. It is not what you want that you attract. You attract what you believe to be true. So when we have those thoughts and those beliefs and those values, that we believe to be so true, we did not consciously decide, well, I'm going to believe this now. I'm going to make this a belief because most of the beliefs and the values that we hold true to us, we have created when we were at a very young age, three, four, five years old. We have put our beliefs and our values in place. And many, many times, we still operate our lives based on those beliefs and those values that we have established as children, don't we? And many times, they're not even our own beliefs and values. Many times, they are the beliefs and the values of our parents. It is their beliefs about money, their beliefs about relationships. And many times, we have learned to model them, and we have started to believe them and believe them to be true for us. So... All of that happens in our subconscious mind. We don't consciously decide that. So if we have created our beliefs and our values on a subconscious level, and if we want to change them, we really must change them also on the subconscious mind, not on the conscious mind. Because we do not, and correct me if I'm wrong, raise your hand if you decide, if you choose on a conscious level to have negative thoughts about yourself. They just pop up, don't they? And we all have them. We cannot change our past experiences. We cannot change what happened to us. But what we can change is most certainly is how we feel about it now and what we make up about that now. 
there is a difference between what happened to us and how we feel about it. Now, we can have talked about a problem that we've had for a long time up and down the wazoo, and we understand it, and we have done forgiveness work, and what have you, but yet the feelings are still there. You know, you still feel bad about what happened. You have forgiven, you understand it, and all of that, but that doesn't mean that the feelings have gone away because the feelings are really part of our subconscious mind. They're not part of our conscious mind. You cannot consciously, analytically think feelings away. That are, they are part of our subconscious mind. So where do they come from? How do they get those, how, how do those feelings even get there? They are anchored in our, in our neurology, in our nervous system. I want you to imagine it a bit like this. You hear, let's say, a song, a song that reminds you from your early childhood, or maybe it is the song that you used at your wedding, and all of a sudden, feelings start to emerge, and you have those happy, wonderful, warm feelings. So you have made an association with the song and the wedding or whatever it is. We call it in NLP an anchor. An anchor is an association we create with something. Anything in life can be an anchor, but not everything has to be. It can be a smell. Maybe you know somebody that you, let's just say, didn't like as much. <laughs> and they always wore the same cologne or perfume. So you've created now an anchor, an association. Every time I smell, smell this person's cologne, it makes me feel angry or whatever it might be inside. So you go on with your life and maybe all of a sudden you meet a perfect stranger and perfectly wonderful and loving and all of a sudden that person has that same cologne. Guess what feelings are starting to come up all of a sudden? Because you have made a neurological connection between the scent and the person. And we create those neurological connections all the time. Imagine the people that are afraid of driving across the Coronado Bridge. I work with many and many of them. They don't say, hey, I think I'm going to create a phobia today because it would be a cool thing. <laughs> and it would just be a great thing to drive an extra half hour down to Chula Vista across that bridge. No. Those people are very smart people. They have not consciously created that fear. Something may have happened at some point. Maybe they were stuck on the bridge in traffic and that made them feel uncomfortable. And then they remember that. And the next time they approach the bridge, they, um, they may say, oh, yeah, last time I drove across that bridge, I felt very uncomfortable. And bam, that feeling comes back. And the next time the same thing happens, and the feeling comes back stronger. And then the next time, because the feeling has come up three or more times, it has become a belief. And the belief has become, every time I cross that bridge, I feel this way. And now they start living their lives based on that very same belief. Now, we can change those anchors. That's the wonderful thing. We can change them. The great thing about being programmed and programming our subconscious mind is when we know that we have been programmed and how we have programmed ourselves, we can change that. We have programmed ourselves in three ways with language, imagination, and emotion. Those are the three ways we program our subconscious mind, and I will share a few ideas of how you can start reprogramming your mind right away. I'll give you another example. Last week, no, two weeks ago, I had um, a client come into town from the East Coast, and she came in for interviews to find a job. She had seven interviews in one day, a day break, and another seven interviews the next day. Now, this woman was terrified of public speaking and of interviewing. She told me the first thing I do when I get in the room that I'm interviewed, I make sure that the door is unlocked, I look where all the possible exits are, my, start, my heart starts to beat fast, I start to sweat, I can't formulate a thought, a thought, I start to mumble. All of those things started to happen for her. Somehow something happened and it became a belief. So what we did is we, she made an association. We made, we created a new association to interviewing. So anytime that she will go interview in 
the future that she will feel happy, wonderful, pleasant, confident thoughts, and no longer the thoughts that she experienced in the past. She programmed those thoughts, and she has the power to reprogram them. She was not born with those thoughts and beliefs, but she could not consciously think them away. Those were feelings, and feelings are part of our subconscious. So we use the subconscious mind to reprogram that. One of the problems is when we want to change our thinking is that we get stuck in the same old thinking. We get stuck in the same thinking patterns that either have created the problem or the thinking patterns that don't help us to solve the problem. And the biggest one is the why. The why question. Why can't I do this? Why can't I lose weight? Why can't I feel confident? Well, guess what? Why is a lousy question. And if you ask a lousy question, you're going to get a lousy answer. <laughs> the why question will keep you in the problem. And it will keep you circling around the problem over and over and over. So what you have to do is you have to change the question that you ask yourself. So rather than asking a why question, you want to ask the question that starts with what or how. What can I do now to let go of weight? You don't want to talk about losing weight because the subconscious mind doesn't want to lose things. What can I do now to let go of any excess weight I no longer need and enjoy the process of doing so? Now you have created a whole new question, and now your mind is going to seek answers and find solutions. Why don't I feel confident speaking in front of people? Well, that's not a good question. What can I do now to feel more confident and comfortable when I'm standing in front of a group of people? So we must change the questions that we ask ourselves. Why do I never have enough money? Versus how can I manage my money effectively and efficiently so that I have enough money to pay all of my bills and have money left over at the end of the month? So it's about changing the way we think. Also, we can reframe our thoughts. And there's two different types of reframes that we have in NLP. And one is a content reframe and one is a context reframe. And what that means, we take our thought and perhaps we give it a new meaning, give it a new content. So there's this woman, and she was, let's call it detail-oriented. Normally, we start the word with an A. And she was very particular about her carpets. And she would vacuum after the kids went to school. She would vacuum her carpets, and the lines had to be all be exactly the same way. You know those carpet lines? So and they had to be just so and just perfect. And then her children came home from school, they didn't take off their shoes, and they left all those footprints in the carpets, and it just drove her crazy. She just could not get over this until somebody said to her, wow, isn't that wonderful, all those footprints. They just symbolize all the loving people that you have in your life and that you've left there. And bam. It changed for her. Yeah. She changed the thought, put it into a different content, gave it a different meaning, and she started to notice how she felt about things. A context reframe is if we take one thing, a thought that we have, and we put it into a different context. So for example, oh, my six-year-old is so headstrong. I don't know what to do with him. I don't know what to do with her. Well, won't you be happy that he or she will be able to fend for herself when she's older. So we put that into a different context, and all of a sudden, it starts to feel differently. Now, I always feel very, oh, I, I, sh I shouldn't say always, I felt very pressured to come up with fantastic quotes and philosophers because all the people who speak here, you know, always quote wonderful philosophers, so I will do the same. So the first one, and that's a wonderful reframe, comes from the donkey from Shrek. <laughs> and he said, come on, princess, you're not that ugly. All right, you are ugly, but you're only ugly like that at night. Shrek is ugly 24-7. <laughs> so a perfect example of 
a reframe. We just look at it in different ways. And the interesting thing about the subconscious mind is that we are bombarded every second by two million bits of information, every second. But our mind can only take in two, uh, can only take in seven plus minus two bits of those information. Now that actually comes from a psychologist by the name George Miller, and he wrote the most highly cited paper in psychology, and it's called the magical number seven plus or minus two. Some limits on our capacity for processing information. So we are bombarded with information all the time, but we don't take everything in and we give it a meaning. We give the experience that we have meaning based on our beliefs, our values, and our past experiences. And the meaning we give our experiences causes us to change the way we feel and our behavior, our body language, and based on that, we start responding to the world and to the people around us. So if we want to change, we want to change at the very, very root, we want to change the things that we make up about experiences or that we have made up about the experiences. Remember, we can't change the past, but we can change what we make up about it. So why don't we change? Why don't we just change? Well, one reason is many times we may not know how to. People may not know, they may not have the tools. Coming here, you get many, many tools every week. But there are other places also you can get some of those tools. Maybe we don't change because there's a benefit of staying in our story. <laughs> oh, poor you. Maybe we, we get a lot of attention by being in our story. And what we do on an unconscious level, we ask for attention the way a little child would do. But we must realize we're not little children anymore. We can now ask in adult ways for that same attention that we desire. We may understand our problems. We have, may have done forgiveness work. But again, understanding and feeling are two different things. So we want to approach the problem from our subconscious mind. The more you talk about it, the more you manifest it. Yeah, if you go every week and you talk about the same problem over and over and over to a therapist, that's fantastic. It starts to help you understand. But after a while, you know what? You've got to get out of your story. And you've got to do something about it. So talking of stories, I want to tell you a story. And the story is about a little crab by the name of Grasper. And Grasper lived underneath the rocks in a tight room with his friends. And one day, Grasper noticed a very pecu peculiar feeling. It's almost like he was going to burst, like something was going to happen, like he was swollen inside. And all of a sudden, made a crack. And all of a sudden, Grasper's shell split open. And he crawled backwards out of his own body. And his shell was right in front of him. So all the other crabs from the tide pool came and they said, how are you feeling? How are you feeling? And Grasper said, I feel great. And the other said, well, of course you feel great because you have just molted for the very first time in your life. But you also have to be careful because when you have molted for the first time in your life, your heart is soft and it is open. And that is very dangerous. You may even have new thoughts, like that there is a better world out there, that there are, is better food out there. So it is really important that you do not listen to any of those thoughts until your shell has hardened again and that you are safe again. So Grasper wasn't quite sure if he, how he felt about the dancer. So he went on and he started to climb up the rocks because he was curious. And it is a good thing to be curious, isn't it? Because when we are curious, we learn. So he climbed up onto the rocks, and all of a sudden, he noticed there was a whole new world out there. There were fishes of many different colors. He had never seen them before. 
There were fishes shaped like stars. There were even birds flying in the air. And all of a sudden, he saw a huge, a giant crab. What are you looking at? The giant crab said. The crab had an awesome accent. <laughs> and Graspa said, I have never seen a crab this big. Well, little one, if you have molded as many times as I have, you will be just as big as I am. But Graspa said, where I come from, none of the crabs are as big as you are, and they have molded many, many times. Well, do they ever, do they ever leave that place of yours? No, they always stay there because they are afraid. Well, then. You have to leave your world if you want to grow. And you have to have a big and open and a soft heart if you want to grow. So I don't have to have a hard heart. No, you have to have a soft, open heart. That helps you to grow. So Grasper was just fascinated by all of that. So he couldn't wait to get back and tell everybody about the giant and all the things that he had seen. So he got back, and he told them about the seagull and about the starfish and all the other things that he had seen, especially the giant. And you'll never, ever believe what the others said to him. So anyway, to change our story, we know we must understand <laughs> that it affects our story is part of our subconscious mind. And we must understand how our subconscious mind works. Our subconscious mind is programmed by language, imagination, and emotion, as I said before. Now, our subconscious mind, subconscious mind operates very differently from our conscious mind. Now, the interesting thing, talking about a conscious mind, did you know that we are not born with a conscious mind? Our conscious mind is here to reason, to judge, to criticize, to analyze, to accept, and to reject. We are not born criticizing, rejecting things. If you think of a two-year-old, they don't criticize or analyze when you tell them Santa Claus is real. Let me think about that for a moment. No, they just believe you. Everything you tell those little kids, they believe it. Our conscious mind is the very critical part of our mind, and that part of our mind is fully developed at around the age of seven. Before that, we live our lives from our subconscious mind. And our subconscious mind does not know the difference between reality and imagination. It will believe everything to be true. And many, many times, we are in our subconscious mind, and you know that, perhaps not consciously, because you cry when you see a sad movie, don't you? You do. Well, consciously, you know that is not true. That is not real. You don't need to cry. But at that moment, your conscious mind, the critical part of your conscious mind, is just taking a nap. And then the movie bypasses the critical part of the conscious mind. It enters the subconscious mind, and the subconscious mind believes it to be true. The subconscious mind does not know the difference between reality and imagination. So what would happen if you start to imagine wonderful, positive, happy thoughts? Just saying. The subconscious mind will take language literal, and it will take feelings as a fact. Also, the subconscious mind does not know a negative. Don't think of a cookie. How many of you thought of a cookie right now? I told you not to think of a cookie. So here is the problem. When we talk about our, our challenges, I don't like the word problems, our challenges, you know, we may say, oh, I don't want to be poor. Well, where does the mind go to? It goes to poor. When I, said, don't, when I worked with smokers and I helped them quit smoking, I said, well, stop talking about cigarettes and smoking. Even if I say I'm not going to smoke anymore, I'm not going to have cigarettes, I'm giving up cigarettes, I'm giving up smoking. Well, what does the mind go to? Cigarette, smoking, smoking, cigarette, cigarette, smoking. And then he said, oh, I wasn't supposed to think of that. But by that point, it is too late. Because the subconscious mind has made an association and has created the desire for a cigarette. Next thing you know, they're lighting up. 
That's why when we, when we speak affirmations, we speak them in the positive, and we affirm what it is that we choose to have in our life, not what it is that we no longer want in our life. So coming back to the thoughts, what is a, what is a thought composed of? A bunch of words. If you don't have words, you cannot formulate a thought. So ultimately, if you change the words you use, you can change the way you feel. You change the thoughts, you change the, the, the way you feel. Please close your eyes for a moment. Go inside. Repeat out loud after me. I have to. I need to. I should. I have to. I really need. I know I should. I have to. Put some feeling into it. I need to. I should. I know I should. Well, how are you feeling? You have not even had a thought yet, and you felt horrible just by saying <laughs> phrases out loud. Every word that you speak, your mind has a connection. Every word, there is a feeling attached to every word. Some have stronger feelings, some have less strong feelings. Close your eyes again one more time and repeat, I choose to. It is my choice. I can. I will. I do. I create. Interesting. Opportunities. Possibilities. It is my choice. I will. I do. I can. I am. How are you feeling now? And you didn't even finish the sentence. Now, we always talk about this being a practical spirituality. How about we practice changing our language? And when you find somebody at lunch that says, I have to, I need to, I should, you're going back to them and say, you have to? Really? You have to? We don't have to do anything. Replace I have to, I need to, I should with I choose to. It is my choice. I'm going to, I will. The reason why you felt so bad after the first set of words, I have to, I need to, I should, on a subconscious level, you feel that you do not have a choice. The choice has been made already by someone else, a concept or something. You are not at choice anymore. How do we feel when we're not at choice? We feel stressed. So if you can only change these three phrases, I have to, I need to, I should, and replace this with I choose to, I'm going to, all of those presuppose that you made a choice. Raise your hand if you agree you're going to do this today over lunch. If you ha hear anyone, come on, <laughs> come on, I want to see all hands up there. Thank you. Practical spirituality, because if you only come here to listen to the talk and you don't practice what you hear, what good is it? What good is it? Also, pay attention to what it is that you say to yourself. The book, again, that I opened yesterday, the next highlights, highlighted section said, the seemingly harmless habit of talking to yourself is the most fruitful form of prayer. What is it that you're praying upon? Are you praying on positive, happy thoughts or less than? We also program our mind with imagination. As I said, our brain does not know the difference between imagination and reality. The best time to program yourself is when you go to sleep at night. Your mind, your subconscious mind, will take into your dream states your last activity, last thought, the last feelings that you have experienced. So when you do your affirmations, when you look at your vision board, whatever it is that you have, Feel as if you are already there. Imagine it vividly. Imagination is the beginning of the growth of all forms, and faith is the substance of which they are formed. Oh, sound great there. You want to hear that one again? Imagination is the beginning of the growth of all forms, and faith is the substance of which they are formed. Visualization is the language of our subconscious mind. To quote another very well-known philosopher, Peter Pan, 
Just think of happy things and your heart will fly on wings forever in never, never land. Daydream. Last but not least, it is his emotions. Motion creates emotion. When we exercise, we start to feel better. Motion creates emotion. Amy Cuddy, she's a social psychologist from Harvard, and her research is mostly based on nonverbal behavior and the effects of social stimuli on hormone level. Gave a talk, I encourage you to look it up. And they were looking at people, they had people take on a power position, whatever that meant for them. They would take saliva and they would test the saliva for A, the power hormone, which is our testosterone, and B, our stress hormone, which is cortisol. And they just made a note of that. After only two minutes of standing in a power position, everybody's testosterone level went up and everybody's cortisol levels went down. Then they also had the same people take on positions of defeat and helplessness, and they tested again. Everyone's testosterone levels went down and everybody's um, cortisol levels went up by two minutes of assuming a position. So motion creates emotion. The way we stand, the way we move will make us feel certain ways. Get into the emotional state of what it would feel like to live the life that you desire. Fake it till you become it. Fake it till you become it. Walk as if it is already here. The other interesting thing is you want to feel it in your heart. The Institute of Hearth Math, I didn't even know there was a thing like that, but they um, say that our heart's energy field is 5,000 times more powerful than our head's energy field. And it is by no coincidence that the heart is the very first organ that develops in a fetus. Very first. So get into the emotional state, change your language, feel it as if you're already there. Pocahontas said, listen with your heart, you will understand. So, about Grasper. So he came back and he told everyone about what he had seen. And all the other crabs said, oh, that is just silly. You know, when you're out of your shell, when you're out of your shell, you know, we're very likely to imagine things and we think that we can do things. So you just need to stay here with us and be safe until your shell has hardened and just get rid of all of those thoughts. Those are just silly. You probably just imagined those. So Grasper was wondering all this, and well, maybe if I just imagined all of that, maybe it wasn't even real. So he just went on with his days the way he always did until sometime later, all of a sudden, he felt all swollen inside again. And he heard that crack. And his shell split open again, and he once again, he crawled back outside of his body. And he knew that there was something out there. So he decided not to listen to anyone else. And he decided to start running, to climb over those rocks. And the other crabs, they start to block him. They wanted to keep him safe. They started to block him. But guess what? It was too late because he already reached the top of the rocks. And so had the others. And they saw everything that was out there in this big world. And they never returned, and they lived happily ever after. <laughs> Thank you.